So good morning. Um, it's actually really interesting how these are all building on each other. Um, I, I think that actually is a good thing. It means that we're starting to build a cultural consensus about both what is important in these settings and how to go about changing them. Um, I've worked on violence for about 35 years, all in these more low-income settings. And I think it's really important to recognize that I think norms are probably important across the board with different types of violence, but specifically in the case of partner violence or violence in families, the difference in levels that we see, which are profound, they're order of magnitude differences in the frequency of partner violence, for example, in, let's say, the United States, Australia, Europe, and many of the settings they're working in. So 4% uh, a year of women in, let's say, the U.S. versus 40% a year in these kinds of settings. And I think that a big chunk of that difference in the overall level are these normative and, and, and belief-driven systems, which is sort of, in effect, the low-hanging fruit that we can go after in terms of really shifting. And what I wanted to share with you today is just uh, a few observations around um, this concept and then some data from a recent intervention trial that we've done at the Center for Gender Violence and Health um, that demonstrates empirically sort of the importance of some of these ideas. So we started out, when I first started thinking about this, women's groups for donkey's years have been trying to do things to change attitudes and beliefs around violence. But what I realized is that we were very imprecise when we use this kind of terms. We, we talk about changing gender norms. And within that, that bucket, we had behaviors and ideologies and attitudes and all sorts of things. And we didn't really discipline ourselves in trying to, to understand the distinctions. Are those distinctions important? Do some of those distinctions give us insights that might help us with programming? So the first thing I started out with is just, OK, what role do norms, as opposed to some of these other ideas, play in perpetuating intimate partner violence? And is intimate partner violence in the settings in which I work a norm? Or is it something else? Um, you're right, this is very slow. I think it probably is a norm a few places. And, and the distinction there is that there are probably places where it is both expected, appropriate, and sanctioned if you don't comply. But more often, I think violence itself, or in, in, in relationships, is not a norm, but it's held in place by a, met, a matrix of other interlocking norms and practices. These ones around what it means to be a man, what it means to uh, issues around family privacy and the like. And so what this slide is just showing is that it's, it's not just the norm. Right? So it's, it's attitudes, it's schema and scripts, as um, Christina was talking about. And sometimes what's important is not that the violence itself is a norm, but that it's upheld by other interlocking norms. So let's look at what that means. If we can get it to go forward. There we go. So, for example, in the settings, and you heard this in the presentation so far, I mean, you have domestic violence being held up by certain factual beliefs that women won't obey unless they're beaten. That's a factual a, a belief about how the world works. Um, there's also a belief that men are the natural or God-ordained head of the family. And, and in these settings, whether it's Muslim or Christian, there's oftentimes you know, people readily go to the Quran or to the Bible and say, you know, that God created women as the hand servants of man and, and that wives should submit to their husbands. And so there's this sort of naturalization process that goes on. There's also positive attitudes, you know, towards the process, it, like that hitting is actually an acceptable form of discipline and one that actually works to achieve your end. Then there are, as Christina said, normative expectations, which are if I, if, 
that other men, for example, might look down on me if I can't keep my wife in line. So there is where a masculinity norm is actually in encouraging uh, disciplining or violence, um, even if the violence itself, if he wouldn't be sanctioned, it's, it has to do with his identity as a man. The other ones you see very closely linked are norms of family privacy. So you don't intervene in other people's business. Uh, you know, a man's house is his castle. I mean, all of these things are, are deeply embedded belief systems. And then schema, which you've already heard from Christina about what it means to be a good wife, right? Oop, oh, that went too fast. So you've already heard a lot about this notion of discipline and a vast, a, a huge portion of the violence in these low income settings is framed conceptually as discipline. Um, so here, you know, and, and again, there's acceptable forms of discipline and there's non-acceptable. So if it's for a legitimate reason with a legitimate severity, it's okay. If it's for some reason, if it's arbitrary, or it's beyond the pale in terms of its severity, then people will intervene. So here you see, I think that if a wife is guilty, the husband has the right to hit her. If I have done something wrong, nobody should defend me. But if I haven't done something wrong, I have a right to be defended. And there's always that line, and that line sort of shifts in different settings, but you find that line everywhere. If it is a great mistake, then the husband is justified in beating his wife. Why not? A cow will not be obedient without beatings. Now, I mean, you've heard similar ones in, in northern Uganda. I could, you could basically go into the transcripts of 50 different countries and you would find these exact same quotes. I mean, this is something that you see over and over again. So we're not just picking out these uh, examples. Um, now, I've been thinking a lot about some of what I've learned from Christina around schema and this idea of sort of deeply ingrained cognitive structures. So these, these, these neural maps of association. Um, and one of the things is one of the reasons that gender gets primed and these gender scripts get primed so easily is that everything is gendered. I mean, you, it's almost like race. You can't avoid recognizing someone's skin color. Um, at, we perform gender in what we wear and how we interact with each other. So we're constantly priming this concept of gen, uh, these gender roles and script. Another one that I've been playing with, though, is, that, is about the concepts, for example, of ownership. So you frequently see in these settings the notion that men own women and parents own children. And they use those terms. And so what, can you, what does ownership mean? If you own something, you can dispose of it. You can do what you, as you will with it. Um, you can give it away. You can share it with, you know, um, and so you have these traditions of men sharing their wives with other men. Um, you know, so it, this notion of once you hit this idea of ownership, it, there's a cascade of other things that get triggered. We also see this with purity, which is a deeply held sort of moral belief system and that violated women are impure. And you see that over and over again. And also notions of honor. So some of these things in invoking and in, in, in framing the issue in these terms, um, uh, what's the word I'm for, kind of in, in invoke um, these different deeply held kind of schema. So I, I wanted to put this caution in here, though, because I think there's been a lot of interest in norms, and, and I think that's good. But norms are not the only things that hold these practices in place, right? So norms are one element of what sustains harmful behavior. So w if you think about it, you have sort of individual factors. And here I would put things like agency, you know, aspiration. Some women don't even have, can't even imagine a life that is different from what they have had because they don't see anything else, um, or, or individual beliefs. And many of our empowerment programs that we have done actually work on trying to increase agency, increase aspirations, and, and, and challenge some of these beliefs, create self-efficacy, for example. 
Then there's the social realm, which is the norms and the networks. But then there's also material realities, right? So sometimes um, you could change a norm around girls' schooling or expectations of girls' schooling, but if there are no schools or the schools are not, uh, don't teach well, you know, you're not going to be able to necessarily achieve your outcome just by addressing the norm. And likewise, these structural, what I call structural drivers, which are things that are large kind of, you know, property regimes, who, who owns land, what does that mean in that setting about the power and the privilege that you are afforded, um, migration, conflict, all of these other things. So um, I just, I put that up there because sometimes I, I don't want us to get too focused on norms, recognizing that when we, when we build programs, we have to think about these other elements. Um, this is just to give you a sense of how common some of these ideas about the justification are. Um, and, and what you see here is, you know, there are places where 78% of, of women agree that it's appropriate to beat your, for a husband to beat his wife if he disagrees. So um, what I wanted to, though, get to is this cross-sectional studies that we, we have quite a bit of data now showing that compared to all the other factors that are associated with risk of partner violence, that attitudes and, and norms, which I'm using it loosely because what we do is we aggregate attitudes up to a community level as sort of a surrogate for norms. So if 80% if of people in a community all believe that it's okay to beat your wife, then we, we're using that as a surrogate. So what you see is that it comes out as one of the strongest factors predicting risk in you know, widely different settings, Bangladesh, India, Brazil, Peru. Um, also a multi-country study that I did looking at 88 surveys of the demographic and health surveys, the single greatest factor was community level uh, acceptance of partner violence as a driver of individual level risk and of the overall level of risk. So one of the things I just wanted to share before closing though was we now that's just looking at the association right in cross-sectional studies. But what we've now been able to do is go in to uh, an intervention where we have shown dramatic reductions in violence and see, well, what actually, of our theory of what we were trying to do, what, where did the actual reductions occur? And, and what was mediating that? Um, and I'm using an example many of you probably have heard of, of SASA, which was a community mobilization pr project. It, it did a lot around norms. Um, I can give more information if you're interested, but this was something that was in Uganda for three, uh, almost three years in the field. Um, and what, what we, I'm just going to go ahead um, on this. What we did is we, sh we showed that it was about a 50% reduction in partner violence um, over um, that three-year period. Um, and what we wanted to do in the next level is look at, okay, how did that work? What changed? And so we look looked at mediation. So our original, if you look at our original hypothesized mechanisms, what we had is we said, okay, we're either working through transforming norms, so the acceptability of wife beating or gender norms, um, the privacy norms, or maybe it's the community responding. They were trying to get people to intervene. Um, maybe we're working through improving the relationship. There was a lot with couples about communications and, and, and conflict. Maybe we're working at an individual level. So what, what, which of these was the pathway through which this change seemed to occur? So if you look at that, what you see is, is you basically have one model on the left. And on the, on the right, what you do is you put in your hypothesized mediator. And if your effect size, so the strength, changes, it suggests that that's actually a way in which uh, it, it suggests that that's one of your pathways. So what we did is we put them in one at a time, community, relationship, and individual. And what we found is out of all of the things that pathways that we hypothesized, if you look at it, 70% of the risk of victimization was mediated through changes in the acceptability of wife beating. 46% um, 
was related to specifically uh, some norms around women's uh, gender related to women working. Um, and none of it was through changing how the community responded, which we, ex we expected that to actually be an important element. With perpetration, 95% of perpetration was through acceptability of wife beating. Um, and so th that to me shows that not only in these cross-sectional studies, but actually when we're looking at how did we achieve the change that we saw, it was through addressing some of these key issues. With relationship issues, um, the biggest ones were reduced suspicion around infidelity and improved communication around sex. So all of these issues are around uh, sexual fidelity. And with individual, it was the attitudes around acceptance. So just my last slide is um, what this tells me is that we need to do all of the work that we're doing on gender and, and on uh, access to resources and the like but that if we don't address these specific normative beliefs around the acceptability of violence and discipline and, and everything, that we, we will be missing a huge opportunity in terms of, of, of reducing both individual women's risk and the overall level of violence. So I, I'll leave that. I, didn't, I just wanted to thank, this is work actually done out of my center, not by me, by uh, my colleague Tanya Abramsky. Thank you.